consciousness returned suddenly. His body felt stiff and sore, and he could hardly move. Where am I? James wondered. Scraps of memory flitted, ghost-like, through his mind, but he couldn't hold on to them. Slowly he opened his eyes, and a young woman came sharply into focus, her face pale, her hair close-cropped, gold-blonde. She was a beauty, with classic Nordic looks, grey eyes and lids stenciled with black coal. Teeth, as she grinned, as sharp as her cheekbones. James could smell the cool, sweet odour of Lily of the Valley. You are awake, then, Bond. The girl's voice was low, and the foreign accent seemed somehow familiar. Do you remember anything from last night? James took in his surroundings, a narrow bed with starched sheets, the familiar cream walls and high ceilings, though this wasn't Glencourse. Where am I? You are in the school sanatorium. You had an accident. The groundsman found you last night. Last night? Accident. James's head throbbed and his mouth was dry. Are you a nurse? I am Miss Axman, but you may call me Herta. Wait. James tried to get up, but his shoulders hurt. His body wouldn't respond. Uh, Mar Marcus, my friend... Marcus Stevenson was hurt. We were out in the grounds. You were lucky. To be struck by lightning. Lightning? Last night your friend was out on the golf course when he was struck by lightning. You must have been with him. The two of you, out in the night playing a prank of some sort, I suppose. There was regret in Herta's eyes. I am afraid Marcus Stevenson is dead. No! James turned his head as if to shake the words back out of his ears. Pain stabbed into him, and memories slipped through. No! I remember. He wasn't struck by lightning. It wasn't like that. You're lucky you weren't killed too, Bond. She stared at him with cool grey eyes. You so easily could have been. I'm telling you, it wasn't like that. James took hold of her wrist. Listen! Marcus was in the trunk room with Whittaker... Herta's smooth forehead grew lined with concern. I'm sorry? He, he was helping with an experiment. James stared up at her. Wait. Your voice. I've heard you before. Oh, dear. You're growing distressed. She looked sadly down at him. I must give you a further sedative bond while we decide what to do about these troubling memories. What? James gasped as he felt a needle scratch his arm. Please, nurse! I'm not a nurse. I am a scientist. Her smile was the last thing James saw as the blackness closed in. Who are you? Bond. James Bond. I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. Shaken, but not stirred. 007 reporting for duty. These are the 00 Files. Welcome to the podcast of the 00 Files. My name is Don Zerdeman, and in this podcast, you can listen to a terrific interview with Steve Cole. Now, Bond fans around the world know Steve for his excellent four young Bond adventures. After Charlie Hickson finished his fifth and final Young Bond book by Royal Command in 2008, there was a hiatus of six years, and then Steve Cole published his first Young Bond book with the title Shoot to Kill. Now, in the Bond universe, a six-year gap is unfortunately not unheard of. Remember the six years between License to Kill and GoldenEye? Well... Like with Goldeneye, Steve Cole proved that even after six years, Young Bond was still wonderful and incredibly relevant, even if the stories are set in the 1930s. And he quickly followed up Shoot to Kill with Heads You Die, Strike Lightning, and his final entry with the excellent title Red Nemesis. At the very beginning of this podcast, you heard an audio clip from Steve's third book, Strike Lightning, narrated by Nathaniel Parker and published by Nudged Audio. 
It was the beginning of chapter 5 and also the beginnings of all kinds of shenanigans that take young James from Scotland to the Netherlands in search of a ghost train. I had the pleasure of interviewing Steve and I was completely surprised by his openness. He was very kind answering my questions that he probably had already answered a thousand times before. Now in the interview we also briefly mention Anthony Horowitz and Charlie Hickson, who also had to endure my poor interview techniques earlier this year. Those interviews are still published under the name of the podcast of James Bond Netherlands, which is a completely different podcast. But Steve is now officially the very first interview on this new platform, The Double O Files. I am planning on re-releasing the older interviews, including Anthony Horowitz's and Charlie Hickson's one, so also on this platform, the podcast of The Double O Files, so eventually all the interviews will be nice and snug together. I'm a bit of a completist that way. Now, I already know it will annoy me a little that the older interviews will be published after this one, thus completely ruining any sense of continuity, but then again, nobody really likes James Bond because of its flawless continuity. Let's not go there right now. Anyway, if you haven't listened to my earlier interviews yet, don't worry. They will be published in this podcast stream very soon. So at this point, I should also probably point out that you can go to our website, www.thedoublefiles.com, that is the00files.com, and read all kinds of interesting articles on James Bond and watch some location videos and plenty of other stuff. Also, follow us on social media and obviously subscribe to our podcast in your app so you will automatically get all our episodes as soon as they're published online. That about wraps up my very long and winded introduction. Before I finally switch to the interview with Steve, I would like to point out one more thing. At the very end of this episode, Steve provides a wonderful exclusive. He has produced a whole new James Bond song, a theme song, for his first young Bond book, Shoot to Kill. So, make sure you listen all the way to the end, because I've listened to this song now a couple of times, and it's an absolute belter. Now, finally, let's start the interview. Steve Cole, welcome to our show. It's so wonderful to have you here. Wonderful to be here, thank you. Uh, and I understand that you have a slight cold, so you sound very ominous uh, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I sound, yes, deep and sinister. I've been doing lots of uh, lots of events at festivals talking about uh, books, and yeah, and then uh, a cold hit as well, so my voice has been, uh, yes, compromised, shall we say. Well, you sound very villainous. That's wonderful, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and if I understand correctly, you're now uh, in the UK, right? I am, yes. Okay, so you're nice back home. And uh, we're going to start the interview um, on your young James Bond adventures. Mm. Um, but first, I have a couple of introduction double O questions that I always ask uh, guests of the show. And the first one is, uh, which James Bond film have you watched most recently? And why that one? Most recently, I watched Live and Let Die. So have I actually. <laughs> oh, okay. Why, why did you watch it? <laughs> uh, I watched it last week in preparation for our next uh, film review. Well, yeah, it is. It is one of my uh, one of my all time favourites. And uh, when I'm feeling a bit under the weather, you know how you, comfort food can be good. I, I find live and let die is kind of like a comfort food for the soul. Uh, I love seeing uh, Roger striding out in his uh, first outing. So uh, yeah, that's probably why, why I watched it. What do, What do you like about it? Is it is it the cult? Is it the, the voodoo? Is it the... Yeah, I think the, the voodoo stuff is, is really interesting. I love the soundtrack as well. Oh, just, that's amazing. Yeah, one of my favourite soundtracks right the way through. I just love all the incidental cues and the brilliant renditions of the, uh, of the theme tune within. And I don't know, I think it's got so much invention. The thing that grates is that Bond is calling everyone darling every, every five seconds. It's like, oh, darling, darling. It's like, oh, stop calling them darling. But of course, it's a product of its time, um, and uh, and yeah, and, and, and the the climax is is great. I love the uh, suspension over the sharks and the blood and the expanding bullet. It's all done so imaginatively. It's it's really great fun. Really, even the the balloon kananga. That's that's <laughs> the... <laughs> the effects. Okay, the effects there aren't <laughs> good, but I just love it. it's the it's the idea of it. I mean, because I guess because I'm I'm used to growing up with, uh, with a lot of 
a lot of cult TV with quite low budgets, you learn to see beyond the effect to the intention behind it. Um, and so, yeah, I even forgive the uh, the giant inflatable sofa <laughs> thing at the end there. <laughs> my, my son asked me when we watched the film uh, last week, why didn't he just get eaten by the sharks? Wouldn't have that been better than have him blow up? I said, ah, so well. <laughs> they thought it was a good idea at the time, apparently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they wouldn't have got the certification if they had had him torn apart by the shark. Maybe. Had to, wait, Maybe yeah. wait, had to wait a little later for that one, I guess. Okay, second question is, if you could play any character in the next Bond film, which part would you love to play? Well, with the with the voice as it is at the moment, I'd like to play, yeah, a, a, a sinister operative uh, or maybe uh, one of those... Uh, shadowy figures that comes out to offer information i just like a little a little cameo role would do me i'm not not looking for too much uh, <laughs> exposure in the movie but you know if they want to come to someone with a with a very deep voice i have a message for you mr bond i'll be very happy to do that you know <laughs> oh, that sounds pretty good actually but you want to be a baddie uh, then, yeah, yeah uh, definitely okay so the last one is um if you could go back in time and uh, either interview ian fleming broccoli and saltzman or john barry Who would you choose and why? And what would you ask? Uh, well, it's that's a good question. I think it would have to be Fleming. And I'll, just, I'll go back and I'll, I'll show him the young Bonds and say, well, what do you think? Um, that's what I'd, I'd have to say. I'd like to, to obviously to talk to him about how he really saw his creation, how that changed over time, um, just to get some, some some candid truths from him, I suppose, over, over it. Because you know so much about the uh, the story from the outside and so much has been said about it from those who knew him. And I think it would be fascinating to to have that conversation with uh, with the man himself. Yeah, um, I actually talked uh, briefly uh, to Charlie Hickson about this. And he said that Fleming probably wouldn't be a fan of the young Bonds because he described uh, Bond had a pretty relaxed childhood. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, the, both of you pretty much uh, screwed that up, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true. <laughs> But then again, you know, they're great fun to read. So well, <laughs> all is forgiven. So <laughs> how did you become a Bond fan then yourself? Myself? Well, um, Bond was was so prevalent in the UK that even before they they started showing them regularly on television, I knew all about Bond, and I had uh, the Aston Martin from Goldfinger, uh, the little corky toy. Yeah, I have it right there behind me. Yeah. Oh yeah, mine mine is in uh, the my bedroom at the moment actually. Yes. Uh, mine's in a, in a I don't know the desk. No, my, it normally sits under my desk. But you I took still it have the little figure uh, that, that oh, pops oh, out. I, I lost that in five Long minutes. Long gone. Oh. Yeah, vanished behind the sofa, never to be seen. But I did find you could actually put small pebbles in there. And then use it as a discrete firing mechanism against your older sister. That's what I found. Um, so I could, I'd be standing across the room and I could operate it. She'd be going, what? And I'd be like, nothing. I'm just playing with my car. So that was all right. But yeah, so I had that. And there were photographs of Roger Moore all over the place in my house because my mum you know, was, was you know, a huge Roger Moore fan. I was born uh, pretty much the, the first episode of The Persuaders was on television. My mum refused, she was in going into labour, she refused to go to the hospital until she had finished watching Roger and the Persuaders. So, you know, she was pretty, pretty keen on him. And so I saw all these photographs around the place. And I think the, what what really confused me was when there was a, there was a big uh, poster on, on a cupboard in the kitchen of Roger Moore in his space suit from Moonraker. And I was thinking, I thought James Bond was a spy, what's he doing in space? I mean, I would have been about, I don't know, seven or eight at the time, eight maybe. And For Christmas, I found in the remainder bin in, in a news agents, I found um, James Bond Moonraker, you know, the novelization, yeah. rather than the, the Fleming original, um, and because it was it was cheap and because they had Roger Moore on the cover, I knew my mum would love it. And so I, I remember buying that and I started reading, I read the first few chapters before I wrapped it up. And that was kind of like, gave me that my, that first taste of, a, like a, of an adult adult world, really, I suppose, looking in there. And then I think uh, after that, the first... Bond film I saw at the cinema was For Your Eyes Only, which I was allowed to see by myself, which was, was a treat. I, would, I could only have been nine or ten then. It was 81, I think, it came out. Yeah, yeah. and I was and I was ten in September 71, yeah. so it would have been about nine, I think. And that was, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember sitting in the cinema so vividly, watching it all and enjoying it all, even though it's quite atypical of, of Bond films, particularly for that time, uh, it made a big impact. And then when The Man with the Golden Gun was uh, was shown on television, that was the first one we video recorded. Ah. And I watched The Man with the Golden Gun to death. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I loved all the uh, you know, the scenes in Scaramanga's sort of funhouse of, of death and the 
and the scenes, uh, obviously the, the car chase and the, and the stunt. I mean, it was all, you know, so colourful, so so exciting. Yeah. Well, I guess what got me into the, the books was um, when A View to a Kill came out, uh, I was intrigued that it was based on a short story because I thought, well, how have they got an entire film script out of a short story? And so I went to the library, uh, Bedford Central Library, and I read A View to a Kill and realised how different it was. But also it kind of really opened my eyes as to this very different kind of bond. He wasn't the superhero I'd seen geriatrically running around Paris in the movie. It was actually somebody who was, who was world weary, things weren't grey. It was, you know, suddenly I was I was I read the rest of those short stories. And that made me start thinking, well, I wonder what you know, the man with the golden gun is 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 like in the in the book. And so it led me on this trail of comparing the books with the with the films as a teenager. And just becoming fascinated by the changes that have been made. I, I, and just realised they were only taking certain elements, certain ingredients, and then turning it into a whole new story. So I found that fascinating. And of course, it, it just turned me on to the whole Fleming uh, novel sequence, which I would then you know, re- return to regularly throughout my adult years. Yeah, so it was from, it was one of those things that was, I would run around pretending to be James Bond with my little finger pistol. Yeah, and obviously never imagining that one day I'd be writing about Bond in the playgrounds of his youth. That's amazing. It's, uh, I, I can hear that you really are, um, uh, you've grown up in uh, the Roger Moore era. Very much, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You want to talk about um, your own James Bond books? Because I send you quite an extensive list of uh, talking points, uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay. I'm not sure if we can make it all the way to the end, but um, <laughs> let's, yeah. let's just dive right in. So on Young Bond in general, well, again, first of all, I'd like to, to thank you for taking the time for this uh, this interview. And um, I recently revisited all your Young Bond books. And uh, I really appreciate now, more than a few years ago, I think, how difficult it must have been to actually write them because they're set between two set worlds, between the world Charlie Hickson created and the world Fleming created. Yeah, that was quite a quite a challenge. And uh, I think that's possibly one of the reasons why I surrounded Bond with a lot of characters in the first one I did, Shoot to Kill. Because in a way, I was slightly nervous of getting fully to grips with that character. Because I was trying to work out, you know, how much like Charlie am I meant to be? How much like Fleming am I meant to be? I wanted to honour Charlie's world, but also wanted to bring something of myself to it as well, of course. And in the end, it was my editor at Random House. When I'm saying to her, I'm not sure how much Charlie, how much Fleming. She said, well, could you could you bring some, some more Steve Cole to it, please? Because that's why we've asked you to do it. So... That, that gave me more, the more confidence to do it, I think. Uh, also, I had this idea that over the four books, because I'd signed up for, for four books, and that was my, my story arc, if you like it, I, uh, I wanted to start James off with lots of allies, friends, uh, you know, sometimes you know, enemies as well, but he had kind of a support base. And then over the course of the books, there's fewer and fewer allies with James until in Red Nemesis, it's really pretty much him and Anya on their own. Because, of course, you know, it's just that was what I saw as, as my mission with these books was to take the Bond who's already, Charlie's left him somewhat more world weary, wiser, hurt by what's happened. And so I didn't want to just repeat that and just have more of the same. I wanted to then to take him further into that darkness, really, and push him towards that point where he has to make that choice whether he can take a life in cold blood. And that's going to defy, decide his whole fate in a way, because we know what's coming. We know where he's going to go, but that doesn't make that initial struggle with himself any less compelling. I hope you you have to you know treat the character in the present. You can't just assume people are going to know why why he's the way he is. You can just push him further down along that road, chipping off those softer edges, and that's very much what I what I intended to do over those four books. So you had a quite an extensive plan for the four books already, and you you took a, a year out of his life, yeah, and you somehow tried to grow him into becoming a loner, uh, almost an adult. Yeah, that was that was the plan. Um, because I I did notice that his friends grew fewer and fewer along the way. Um, So I can skip that question in a a couple of minutes. Um, So it's only been about a year and a half ago uh, for you now that uh, your last book was published. Does that give you enough time to look back on it, give you enough perspective on what you accomplished? Yeah, I I think so. I mean, it's when you when you said that to me, it's 18 months or whatever, I, I couldn't quite believe it. It doesn't feel that long ago. And in a way, because I still travel both within the UK and, and beyond, talking about the books, you know, across you know, Europe and you know, the Middle East and all sorts of places. It, it doesn't feel in a way that I've that I've stopped, even though I'm now talking about the books as a set. 
I still very much feel that, you know, and I, and I suppose I will for some time feel you know, the, the custodian of, of young James Bond at the moment because they're still you know, new and people are still you know, discovering them and stuff. And so that's, that's still very exciting. But uh, yeah, in terms of, in terms of uh, that, that workload, it was, it was a phenomenal workload. Yeah, um, I can imagine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and left me uh, yeah, needing, needing a good break afterwards. <laughs> because the, the last book was published in uh, 2017, but you finished it uh, way earlier, I assume. Yeah, not, probably not that much earlier. Okay. <laughs> I think we were, uh, we were because they, they, they kind of pulled the, uh, the schedule forward. So it was going to be you know, annual releases, but then they, they wanted to do, I think, six months apart towards okay. the end. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I would have written it, yeah, probably maybe six months, six months before it was okay. published. Oh, that's pretty quick then, yeah. Mm. So when does this whole project for you start rolling? How did that happen? How were you approached? Well, it started December 2012. I remember a, a grey day in, um, at home. I just had my lunch and then the phone went and it was my agent. And she said, uh, would, would you be interested in continuing the adventures of, uh, of the young Bond? And I immediately replied, I think that's someone else's job, isn't it? I think someone's already doing that. Um, and then, because of course I knew about Charlie's books, I'd read some of them. And she said, uh, well, no, they, Charlie's not, hasn't done any for, for some time. Um, and they want to, a new incarnation and approach a new author and they'd like you, know, you to try out for it. So, you know, it obviously took me, um, I had to think about it for about three seconds. Mm -hmm. And then said, okay, <laughs> I'll have a go at that. Because of course, once you're offered something as exciting as Bond, it's, uh, if I'd said, oh, no, I'm sorry, no, it's going to, because the thing was, I had a lot of other projects on at the time. So it wasn't like I could turn, you know, turn to it and, you know, and nothing else was going on. I still had to kind of meet commitments uh, for other contracts that were going on. But of course, I kind of immediately pushed everything to one side and started thinking about it. Now, what had happened was the Fleming Publications had uh, been talking to Random House Children's Books about doing a new set of bonds. My agent uh, knows uh, Corinne at uh, IFP and obviously I've done a lot of books with Random House already. Um, I've done some young adult novels about a teenage bomb disposal expert set slightly in the future, which I co-wrote with, uh, with Chris Hunter, Major Chris Hunter, a, a actual uh, bomb disposal expert. And of course, you know, they inevitably they have some similarities to Bond films in terms of you know, the epics, expanse, you know, the thrills, the fights, the chases and all the rest of it. So I guess they knew that I could, I had form in, in doing that, that I could write that, that sort of material, even though I was probably most famous in the UK for my younger fiction, like the astrosaurs about dinosaurs in space or time traveling cows with the cows in action. So I, I've always enjoyed doing different things, different genres. So they had, uh, IFP had decided that yes, let's, let's try Steve. So I went from, I went in for a meeting then just to, to quickly chat through some initial thoughts and, uh, outlined shoot to kill a very basic storyline and the title that come to me. And they liked that. They sent me a lovely uh, set of, uh, Fleming's novels in paperback, uh, to, uh, reacquaint myself, which was very cool. So this big old box came along by then I'd already been down the library and, uh, and borrowed them as well. because I, I mislaid my original set in a house move some, oh, along with, all sorts of treasured books. It's awful. Uh, I don't even like thinking about it. I had a big collection of uh, the Hardy Boys books from uh, from Armada publishing in the 70s. Oh, I lost them all. Anyway, I was, I was straight into that world. And then what they wanted was, before they made a final decision, they wanted a synopsis. They wanted um, synopsis for the, brief synopsis for the three other books I was going to do. Um, how I would carry out a story arc over those four titles. And then they wanted some sample chapters. So I think the first three chapters they wanted. So I kind of threw myself into that and we back and forth a little, uh, Karina and Joe at IFP and then myself. And then I had to go in to meet, uh, the board of, uh, of Fleming. Is it like a, like an yeah. interview? It was, uh... to be honest, it was, oh. it is, a, you know, it was at their, their private bank in Piccadilly in this, uh, this uh, nice meeting room. And it, it felt you know, you, you can't help but feel it. You know, there's all these chairs around this very long table. You think if someone presses a button, I'm going to tip back into a pit. Oh, you know, that's exactly. going to happen. Um, and it was, you know, Lucy Fleming was there with Fergus and, uh, and, and Diggory and uh, various agents and, and rights people. So it was, it, was a, it was a lot of people there. And of course, all eyes are on me asking how I'm going to look after their hero, you know, and am I going to be true to their values for Bond and am I going to, you know, do I know enough about it to, uh, 
to qualify. So it was really it was a, it was a proving uh, mission that one. I'd, uh, I'd optimistically loaded my plate with a few uh, few bits to eat, but I never got a chance to eat a thing because I, of course I was talking the whole time, looking at everyone. And uh, you know there were there were some editorial questions, there were some tonal questions. I think uh, there was I, I can't remember the, the original sample material. I think the the opening prologue was it was a little different. I think I'd done a bit more of I think I told it from the point of view of the the man inside. The flat um, with his girlfriend getting getting shot at and realizing stuff rather than from the point of view of the sniper, which is what eventually happened. So yeah, we, we discussed things like that, and um, and then I went away and, and waited. And uh, a friend was getting married in New York, so I was in May, we were in 2013, I guess by then. And I got a phone call in my hotel room, looking out over Manhattan, that told me I'd got the Bond gig, um, and it felt like quite a suitably uh, Bondian place to. Uh, received that uh, that news it was it was uh, yeah it was a good fun moment because i had to go through that, that whole, i wasn't allowed to tell anyone so i had to go through the whole day with a little extra spring in my step and not being able to explain why they probably thought i was getting married oh that must must be horrible and i really and i couldn't tell anyone for ages in fact all through the uh, the writing of shoot to kill which took place over the summer of 2013 i just had to say i was working on some historical fiction which is I was doing, of course, it was set in the 30s. Yeah, 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 in a way, in a way. <laughs> but with that, I would say just that, uh, and I remember I put the, 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 only, the only tiny, tiny cryptic clue I, I put out online, I think, was I was on the, doing school events in Spain and I was uh, writing a lot of Shoot to Kill heavily in the evening, trying to meet my deadline. And it was a time when Coca-Cola started putting names on bottles for some sort of um, promotional thing. And one of them, I, every time I got one of these bottles of Coke, it had James on it. So I was sort of like sat there saying, I'm just writing my latest latest thing. And there'd be a picture of me on the laptop with this bottle saying James in big letters next to it. That was my only my only clue to it. So yeah, when it was finally announced, I think uh, in about October of that year, a lot of people said, wow, we had no idea that, that was happening. You know, <laughs> what, a, a, what, a, what, a, what a relief. <laughs> and I was like panicking about what I'm allowed to say, not allowed to say the title, don't say the title, because we're going to announce that next year. Uh, the Hay Festival. So there was all this. It was being like being on a secret mission myself, uh, not being allowed to uh, to tell anyone what's going on. Oh, it must be horrible. I couldn't do that. So then you start writing, and one of the questions I have is: Is it well? Obviously, you are an experienced children's author, mm. uh, but then Bond is very much um, meant for adults, and and horrible things happen. I mean, he's a smoking, drinking, killing, uh, having sex uh, machine. Mr. Kiss, <laughs> kiss, bang, bang. So how, how do you write that stuff for a young audience? What, what topics did you deem inappropriate? Did you try to avoid? Or, for instance, you have quite a lot of gruesome deaths yeah. in your book. <laughs> That's not a problem? <laughs> no, I don't, think, I don't think it's a problem. But I think, I think um, you know, violence, when handled correctly, is, is understood. I mean... Obviously, there's a, there's a huge difference between reading something and watching something. And when you're watching something on a film, the director is um, making the the choices for you of what you can see. When you're reading a book, of course, a child's imagination can can show the entire thing. But I think because they're they're used to a certain the, the violence they'll have experienced is is normally from the cinema, and the violence you can get away with in a in a twelve certificate uh, over in the UK. You know, like a like a Marvel blockbuster, or or indeed you know, the the more recent Bond films. They've all been twelves. What I found interesting actually was reading how many complaints there were to the British Board of Film Certification over Spectre. More complaints over that than anything else. A lot of them going on the the eye gouging, you know, sequence that which was longer in the original cut. I think they had to kind of cut it short. But so yeah, there's some, some pretty nasty nasty violence happens. But that that didn't bother me. I don't, I don't ever set out to write for children. If you like, you're you're writing for the audience you think is appropriate for your your subject. And I knew that. There'd be a lot of adults interested in reading Young Bond as well. Um, and I didn't want to make some sort of awful, sanitized, you know, watered down version of Bond, because that's really not what, what the Young Bond label is about. It, they're still, you know, full blooded, full on adventures. Um, it's still like a Bond movie swashed between the pages of a book, and that's the sort of story you're trying to tell. So the only things that I avoided and was was instructed to avoid as well by inflaming publications was, uh, you know, the the sexual side of things. But that wasn't a problem because we already knew from Fleming that Bond's 16, um, when he loses his virginity in the brothel with his along with his pocketbook uh, from a view to a kill, of course, and. Uh, and so that meant, well, I don't have to worry about that in a way, which is good because I can concentrate on a, on a different paradigm for, for Bond and uh, the ladies in his life. So each of the, the, the Bond girls, if you like, of a young Bond, although there's a, there's a romantic level in a couple of cases, you're not having to dwell on the sexual aspect. And so 
that that really wasn't was an issue. Uh, there's you know there's, there's there's so much you can do. There's still a fascinating you know stories you can tell. You don't have to ever think oh is this going to be suitable for that person. If you start thinking that the whole time, you're kind of you, you might as well not bother. You have to to have a vision and then try and execute that vision the best you can. And yeah, my vision for for young Bond was was a slightly you know uncompromising one when it came to violence. And I think that you know kids you know, in, enjoy. That sort of fantasy death. This is happening in the 1930s. In a way, to them, it's, it's, it's history. And they know that Bond will survive. So it's finding out who's going to survive alongside him, how he's going to get out of the problem, um, and, and hope that the bad guys meet with a really satisfyingly vicious retribution. Um, so, uh, and I was talking to Anthony Horowitz about this in the Alex Ryder books. Man, and he says, you know, one of the best things is, is killing the villains. And yes, there's a lot of violence. But uh, at the same time, that's one of the things that, that gets us turning the pages. It's uh, one of the things that, you know, is, is compulsive. And as long as you show that there are real consequences to that violence, I don't think it's an irresponsible thing to do. Well, one of the things Anthony also likes is to torture Bond. <laughs> <It's one> of... <laughs> but let's move on. Um, your books, something I noticed um, uh, this time because I went mm. back to back through them, are very uh, fast paced. Um, you write short sentences, short chapters, and a lot of stuff happens in just a few paragraphs. Is that just your writing style? Because I have to be honest, I didn't read any of your other stuff uh, yet. But um, is this something that particularly fits Bond, you think? I think it, it fits, you know, it's, it felt right to, uh, to go with the, the shorter, sharper sentences, because I wasn't, I mean, there are elements when you, you sort of, you pastiche elements of Fleming's style, of course, that's slightly dated to a, a modern younger audience, some of the Bond novels, because inevitably, because they're written in the 50s and the 60s. So you're going to have people don't speak in, in, that, in that same way now. And you don't want to start using incongruous slang, but you uh, you, you kind of need to, you know, it's just to, to keep people turning the pages. So my editors would, would make me shorten things up actually a little bit, um, because mine was more authentically Fleming in the, in the early drafts. But they said, no, this is too much like a love letter to Fleming. You know, we need to kind of, you know, get it. Bit choppier, um, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess you know, I'm, I'm known in this country for um, a lot of teachers and, uh, and parents have very kindly told me that my my books for younger readers have helped their child get into reading, and, and one of the one of the, the ways you do that is by you know short sentences, vivid descriptions, cliffhangers to keep them turning the pages until you know, so they want to find out what happens next. So yeah, it's. So I would say the first draft is is much longer and more thoughtful. And as we go along, we would always go to about five drafts on Bond. Um, and so by then, you've taken the story apart in your head and put it back together again several times. And you're rewriting and you're you're constantly cutting down. And actually, reading aloud is is a way of seeing whether a line works. Um, as you go through it, you say, "Oh, actually, yeah, I could. I can. I don't need those words there." And, you, and so you do. Uh, you chop back. And I guess that's why. I hope they read briskly. They're supposed to. They're not supposed to, uh, yeah. to 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 get you bogged down in everything. You just want no. And, but I hope there's enough depth in there too that uh, will satisfy uh, you know audiences of of all ages. That's why. Yeah. Well, I I think you you managed really great at the characterization of um, of all the actors um, in the books. But is it true that you're known for writing action as well? Is that one of yes. your strong points? You think? I think so. Yeah. I mean, that's that's something that's that's often picked up on in my. My work, and I love action scenes. You know, I love you know as as the as the author, you get to direct them in your head, and I kind of you know just imagine it playing on the screen in my head, and then I'm writing down what I'm seeing. You know, writing down just just describing the action really as director somewhere in your brain is uh, shoving the shots onto your uh, that screen in your head. And also, there's a, a lot of real spycraft in, <clears> the, in the books, particularly um, uh, well. In my opinion, it starts more in in your second and third book. Uh, there's a bit more spying going on than 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 just action. Yes. Do you think it's difficult to find new ways now because everything's been done? There are over forty James Bond novels. There are almost twenty five films. I mean, how can you still be fresh? Well, you always just have to look at you know, you know, variations on a theme and uh, and trying to find a compelling setting that's that's different enough. Um, and putting Bond into action that's, I mean, we're helped in a way with the historical context of the young Bond books. Because being in the 1930s, of course, things are slightly different. You've got steam trains instead of, you know, fast moving, you know, electric express trains. You've got, you know, different architectures. You've got, um, well, you've got the um, the airship in Shoot to Kill, for example, which is very different from that. Although while I was writing that, always in my head were the scenes from View to a Kill. A View to a yeah. Kill, yeah. And, uh, Originally, my, my very first draft, I didn't have the airship going up in flames. 
because I, I could just see it over the Golden Gate Bridge and I didn't want to to copy that. But the the instruction did come from the the Fleming board. The airship has to go up in flames. You know, come on, this is this is James Bond, and they were quite right. There's no point being coy about it. You just have to kind of go for it and accept that. You know, it's very different. It's a different setting. It's a different situation. That final struggle needed the flames just to bring it to that final, that final cathartic point, if you like. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I think you just go and look for slight differences or just variations on it. Sometimes, I mean, I remember worrying in in the Heads You Die, Bond is is like hiding under the bed, seeing something, and it felt, in a way, I don't know, just it didn't feel quite right to have James Bond hiding under a bed. But then you think, well, this is the younger James Bond hiding under a bed, you know, and in a way I think all kids can remember, you know, they've probably oversee, overheard things or seen things whilst hiding under a bed. Cause it's one of those places you can hide when you're younger. So it, it seemed uh, quite fitting. I liked the idea of, uh, of being eye level with a corpse when you're down on the carpet and you're seeing that. So it has that, that, that grisly edge as well. Yeah, you can really visualize mm. it. It's, uh, it's a tense scene. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see. Last question on the junk bonds in general is um, I happen to notice, but I might be mistaken, uh, some nice little references to Bond's literary history. Oh, yeah. Uh, the first one was quite obvious to me uh, in the first book when uh, he plays Hoagie Carmichael's son yeah. to get away from someone. <laughs> yeah, that was that was kind of irresistible, really. Um, but there were there were yeah, there's there's a lot of little little nods to the uh, the past in, in Shoot to Kill in particular. I think the, the very first chapter is called uh, "You Asked for It," which of course was the uh, the American title for Casino Royale originally. Was it? I didn't know that. Yeah, and there's lots of yeah. I think online I've made a list of of. 10 in jokes you can find uh, okay i have to look at that i, I noticed in the in your second book he um he picks up a copy of birds of the west Indies. he does he does which i realized would, it would have been in draft form at that time not yet finished. Uh -huh. so again it just seemed being in cuba it just seemed too much of a, a opportunity really to to ignore yeah there's i i like putting in little little jokes like that there's there's a little there's a very subtle little alex Ryder reference i put in for um anthony um where because, of course, in uh, one of the Alex Ryder books is about, and it's called Skeleton Key, set in Cuba as well. The uh, the Kaya Skeleton, I think it's called. Um, and so I have Bond visit it first, uh, or, or go past it first, or recognise it first, uh, when he's floating amongst the keys uh, at one point. So there's a tiny little nod to Alex Ryder in there as well, which I thought would be quite fun. As there are so many Bond nods inside Anthony's books, I thought, why not have the young Bond return the favour slightly? I, I just started his ninth Alex Ryder, I think. Uh, uh, and he has a teacher called Grant Donovan, which is, I believe, Donovan Grant uh, backwards from, from Russia with Love. But there are tons, so, tons of references. So many. There. It's very funny. Okay, I'll, I'll have a. I'll try to find that list because uh, some of your nods were a, a little um, less obvious, but that that definitely sounds very interesting. Shall we delve into uh, Shoot to Kill? Why not? Let us. Uh, so it's set in the beginning of the school year in uh, thirty four, and this is one of the things that you differ from uh, Charlie Hickson uh, or even uh, Fleming that you are quite open to when the story is set. They always try to be a bit more vague and, and, and don't have their bond age and stuff like that. But we're quite open about that. It's the beginning of the school year. Well, it's kind of, I guess it's, it's very, the very, very end of, of the school year because it's it's not that long after by Royal Command. So it's exactly the yeah. start of the summer. Um, yeah. So, so it's in between schools. Yeah. 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 And you don't send him to FET. Fet. Is that FETUS yet? But you decide to send him to Dartington. Mm. How did that come about? Well, the reason I did that was I thought, well, if I start him off in September, in you know the start of the school year in FETUS, everyone's going to be expecting that. Yeah. That's like the obvious thing to do. Plus, also, I thought, well, obviously, Silverfin begins with the young Bond at Eton. I thought, I don't want to have a retread of Charlie's book you know i don't want to have to establish all that first of all what i wanted to do was was something very different and so i was looking into education at the time i did so much research it was on the 30s you know it was it absorbed me for, for a very long time and um i realized that there was this big movement for progressive education at that point and i thought it'd be quite fun to take someone like bond who's been so used to the the rules and regulations of somewhere as rigid as eton and put him into a place where at dartington hall in the, in the 1930s. I mean, yeah, the, it was a completely different way of doing things. If you didn't want to go to a lesson, you didn't go to the lesson, you wouldn't be told off for that. You would, uh, you know, you would not get much of in the way of academic accomplishment by the end of it, but you weren't pushed in that way. You were kind of given space to express yourself in other areas. 
and you know, Bond can, it's not like he's going to flourish in an environment like that. He can just see that it's, he appreciates the difference of it. It also was a way of getting him into a, a co-ed because of course you had um, you know, boys and girls together being educated, which again was something very different from uh, what he found in Eton. So it was really just uh, just doing what I knew Noel would be expecting, really, and to have yeah. this small interlude in his life that's so small it's not even mentioned in his official biography. But it seemed just a way of of getting him in there and doing something different, and that's what I was very keen to do because I was sensitive that um, you know I had big big shoes to fill, and people would be uh, you know interested to see how I was tackling this, and I wanted to do it in a way that hopefully no one would anticipate. Yeah, exactly. You want to make it your own. Mm. Um, now, I heard or read somewhere, I can't really remember, that there's a slight connection between this being the sixth Young Bond book and in Fleming's sixth novel is Dr. No. Yeah. And that was the first film. Uh, so that's why you set it in Hollywood. That's is that exactly right. Yeah, that's and that was my, my first thought and the one I went to uh, Ian Fleming Publications with on my very first meeting with them just to um, to talk about. I was just trying to think of a way of meshing it with the, the main canon of work. And it just seemed to be fun because you know, young Bond hadn't been to you know, Los Angeles before. Um, that would be quite a fun way of uh, of bringing him there. And um, yeah. and again, there's the scene in um, in one of the schools in in Los Angeles where Bond is, I think, running after someone, and uh, essentially he hears the James Bond theme playing from uh, the music hall there. There's a mention of um, you know, there's uh, electric guitar, steel guitars twanging, and sort of, like relentless brass and stuff so again that's another little in joke in there when his this music is like driving along as he's being chased so essentially he's hearing <laughs> the James Bond. he's hearing his own theme song yeah exactly you can it's fun to do little little touches like but uh yeah that was um that was always the idea it was taking bond to hollywood before he actually made it to hollywood that was uh and that of course decided me on various aspects of the plot so it turned out to be quite a fertile ground for that so are there other connections like this with your other three books to let's see the seventh fleming was Goldfinger. Yeah, it, we get? I don't. I didn't. It wasn't something I continued on because I thought it was no. getting like a gimmick if I wasn't careful. But it yeah. felt like a good hook. Okay. For the first title. Just yeah. the first one. Okay. Okay. Because I was trying to figure it out, but <laughs> just stuck there. <laughs> no. Let's see. Well, we already talked about this. That um, he's surrounded by a lot of peers in this book. Yeah. Um, and they slowly the group gets smaller and smaller over the course of the other books. Yeah. Now, one of my favorite characters in this book is Tori Wo. Um, she feels really like a 21st century woman. Yeah. That is pretty much stuck uh, in an earlier century. Uh, so <laughs> how did her character come about? Um, yeah, I think with Tori, I um, well, inevitably, when you, you have a story, you have to work out the best characters to tell it. And then you want to bring something different to the characters. And I was aware I had quite a, a male centric uh, book with all the characters in, in there. And I wanted a strong female character who would kind of lift things along. And you have to be obviously mindful of the times. And she is that inevitable you know, woman in a man's world doing, you know, doing her bit and, and acting very cannily to, um, to outclass, you know, her, uh, her competition in that field. So, yeah, I enjoyed writing Tori so much, in fact, that I originally killed her off in the climate battle, <laughs> but um, I couldn't. I couldn't bear to do it, and um, and the flowing publications didn't want me to do it either. They said, "Oh, we might, we might bring her back. You know, it might be nice to bring her back later in the in the uh, the books." Um, so Tori was allowed to survive, but uh, yeah, that's where that's where where she came from. It was just wanting to yeah, just expose with all the characters in that book. And I realize I look back now, and I, even I'm surprised I put so many characters in. And that was after after I actually took one out. Um, I think it's because Bond is illuminated by the company he's with. You can show different aspects of him with different people he's meeting. So it's not, I didn't just want it to be his peers, so it's like some jolly schoolboy adventure. I wanted it to to have, you know, more more depth and scope than that. So he does meet this undercover journalist, and he does meet, you know, the, the gangsters, and he does meet, you know, he's flirting on the edges of this film world as well. Uh, and meeting you know, young fascists as well at, uh, at the school. So there's there's lots of people to show different aspects of his character. And that's what you that's what I was especially thinking when I was writing Shoot to Kill. I was getting to know this young Bond because, you know, he's nothing like me. Normally, when you're writing a character, um, and it's a character you're creating, then you, know, you, you draw on aspects of yourself, but there's very little of me in James Bond. So I was just sort of like getting, you know, getting, you know, getting the Getting to know each other. 
Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, um, the next question is a bit, I don't know, it might be strange. To me, um, there seem to be some Americanisms in, in the book. This is something I learned because English is not my native language. So I, you this speak is some... incredibly well, I have to say. Oh, thank you. But I still, uh, every now and then, I still learn stuff um, uh, through, uh, through other podcasts and stuff like that. Um, so the word tuxedo is mentioned <laughs> instead of, I believe the proper English word is dinner jacket. Yes, dinner suit, yes. Your dinner suit. And yeah. James uh, is looking for a cab driver instead of a taxi driver. Yeah. So was that on purpose or do I just happen to have the US uh, book version? No, I think that was that's on purpose. It's like, if, um, I think the convention is if you're, if I'm, if there was a building there which had the word center in its title, then I would spell it the American way, you know, C-E-N-T-E-R rather than the UK way of C-E-N-T-R -E, because we're in that country, that's the convention. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of called Tuxedo um, for that reason. I mean, you, you might well have, I don't know if you have the, the e-books, if you do, you might well have the US e-book, which yeah. one of that? I have the e-books, I have the, the paperbacks, uh -huh. uh, and I have the audio books. Uh, I've got too many books. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see that. But uh, yeah, so it, it could be the American, I, I, I'm certain that American right. version will have more Americanisms in it. But. Okay. If, if characters are talking about them, they would use the, the US terms because they're American or they're, they're in America talking about it. Yeah. Okay. So this is something that you already talked a bit about, but uh, to me, it seemed that James was sometimes a little bit incompetent, especially in your first book, mm. uh, when he's fighting judo with uh, Martin at the school, we all desperately want him to win. But uh, it just feels so... Well, you know, so... that's it. Well, it's because he, he doesn't know judo yet. That's, yeah, well, well, he learned a bit. A in, bit. In, in one, uh, was it Sakata? Yeah, I think I think he Hurricane Gold. Yeah, he learned a bit, but not enough against someone who's clearly expert in it. Oh, I hated that scene. Yeah, <laughs> and and again, it was intentional because I I very much wanted to show Bond going from this person who doesn't always get it right. We know that he's going to triumph in the end. He's going to get. It makes you hate the bad guys more. Yeah, if they it, get it, one it, over on your hero. <laughs> And so, and, it, and in judo, as I was researching it, it only, it only takes one hole to go wrong and there's nothing you can do. However good you might be, you know, if you're up against someone who's that much better than you, or has done it, you know, properly and with discipline, was following it at the Olympics, because of course it was it only just started at the Olympics that year, so there would have been yeah. a lot of interest in 1934. It, uh, it made sense. That in a way makes Bond say, okay, well, now I've been, I've, I've dabbled in it and now I've been beaten by it and now I'm going to turn things around and do it right. So it shows us his determination and throughout the four books, you know, his martial arts skills do improve, obviously. And um, it was part of my taking him from being a fallible young man into a much more capable and dangerous young man and other forces around him noting that change and noting his usefulness. So it was, yeah, it was very much intended that in the first book, Bond doesn't always get everything right. And plus, that makes him more interesting. If he, if he doesn't have to struggle for anything, then, you know, we don't root for him as much. But yeah. we have someone who's then, you know, that, that, that final climactic scene in the, uh, the old studio, when you're being hunted down by armed gangsters, it's a dangerous situation. And we, because we've seen James fail before, we don't know, you know, how, what's going to happen. That's, uh, that, that I hope, raises the tension. Yeah, it did. It did. Okay, so let's move on to um, Heads You Die. Um, <laughs> now, this is set only a week or something after Shoot to Kill. Yeah, not much. Uh, in the story. <laughs> They're very close together. Mm. And we start with Dr. Hardiman as a friend from Andrew Bond, his father. Mm. Now, I remember that uh, Jeffrey Deaver, who wrote Carte Blanche a couple of years ago, said that he felt it was always important to include a personal side story. That's what he did in his um, continuation uh, novel. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think it's it's a, it's a good point. It's a good way of immediately upping the stakes for James. Because as particularly, you know, as an adult, he is sent on his missions. As the young Bond, of course, he has no affiliation to any any group and he just ends up stumbling into these adventures. So you kind of want to, to dip into the world around him and, uh, and and have that be a catalyst for it. It was Aunt Charmian who sends him to Dartington Hall because she knows about the trip to America. So she instigates that and I think she'll meet up with him later on. Um, and so having Hardiman there, when we meet him at the beginning, of course, then we, then we lose him and that motivates James. It needs to be something that would give James a strong motivation for getting involved. So uh, yeah, when it's something personal, particularly as we know, he's lost uh, his parents. And because I knew that I was going to be addressing that issue later in the series, right. it made sense to foreground the importance of James's past, people from his past who are still here 
because he's losing that permanence. And I think as teenagers, so much is changing in, in life, in, in your own body, that uh, you, you kind of welcome some permanence there. And so to, to feel another piece going away for James would have been terrible. So to that's a good motivator. It's a strong one for, for sending him through into some very dangerous situations. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And it also, um, I think it really helped that you already knew the, the basic arc of your four books yeah. that really um, makes a, a strong uh, cohesion between the between the novels. So how did you do your research on Havana and Cuba in the 30s? Yeah. That, that's, did, did you go there? That's always the trouble. I, I wanted to go there, but um, fortunately, I, uh, time was against me in terms of uh, this novel in particular. And my laptop died during the, uh, the writing of it. I lost something like 20,000 words of the first oh. draft. It was, it was a horrifying, horrifying moment. The grey screen of death coming up. And I just, it didn't work in the cloud yet. <laughs> I no, I, 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 I had no, no back. I don't. Oh, I don't no. I, I know it's it very, very bad. Now I have. And your listeners won't see this, but now I have this. I bought this thing. This um, is that an airport? Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah, these backup, backup uh, uh. things that's meant to restore it. But I bought it then, back after writing Hedge Tire. It's not even connected. Look at it. It's I'm useless. I'm useless. It's not wireless. It's, no, it's not wireless. It's just plugged in. <laughs> Um, I'm just, I just, I don't know, I, 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 I feel I, I, there's a big technology fail for me. Um, so now I do back up more regularly by using Dropbox, but uh, I still, I'm still not in the cloud. I don't know, I didn't like the cloud. Um, so I was, yeah, and I thought no one's going to believe it. They're going to think that I just haven't written the book. <laughs> so, I was like, Agh! so I had to, yeah, it was, it was a stressful time. We went through a lot of drafts on this one, actually. Heads You Die ended up being one of my favourites of the four, but it, it did have a, you know, quite a, quite an involved history. So uh, I didn't get to go to Cuba. What I did do was I had a, a friend who went out there and did some research for me and took uh, lots of photos. I also got hold of you know lots of, sort of research in the National Geographic, in the libraries, um, getting lots of information. I look, but importantly, I did a lot of reading of. Um, I just scoured anything period I could find. So there was lots of um, black and white newsreels set in Cuba in the uh, late twenties, early thirties. There was uh, obviously it was politically a very unstable back then in the early 30s and you had revolutions and you had all sorts of stuff going on. So I watched a lot of stuff about that to get an idea of what the people were dressed like, what the fashions were then, what the streets looked like. But that was no good for me for the rural setting. So I then, I managed to, after a lot of research, I got hold of this US government uh, official military handbook of the strategic value of all these small villages in Cuba, including what water supply was like, how much space there was for if they could be used as garrisons by troops going through the area, and even information on um, on the the railway network in Cuba at that time. So I was able to piece together that how Bond could travel from one place to another, what options were open to him. And so it took a long time, but it was it was really worth it for me because it, it just made Cuba that much more vivid in my head, not just um, Havana and, and the old town and. And the other buildings there, but also into the rural areas, the tobacco fields and the and the rainforest and uh, and the surrounding area. So yeah, it took a lot, a lot yeah. of work, but it was very very helpful. Have you been there since? No, not yet. Not no, yet. Okay. It's, on, it's on my list of places to go. Yeah. Definitely. Did you think it was time for James to have learned some Spanish? I mean, especially <laughs> after the events in Hurricane Gold. Yeah, you see, I think I think we have to be careful not to forget that James, the young Bond, is also. A teenager and teenagers, you know, I mean, James is very accomplished. You know, he can already speak a couple of languages and he's very good in many things, but he's not superhuman. And you know, he's, you know, he's not, I doubt he was a shining, virtuous example of, uh, of academic uh, valor. Um, so it didn't really bother me. I think it's one of those things, oh, if only I had learned more Spanish when I had the opportunity. And that's probably something that he realizes in, in Heads You Die. Plus, it was a, it was a good opportunity to, um, if, if Bond can understand everyone, it makes it too easy. You don't want it to be too easy. You want there to be uncertainty or, or, or delay or piecing together of clues and information. So, yeah. And that's, that's, that helps the people around him have, have valid tasks to do as well. Yeah, yeah, it was great uh, that Hugo was there to translate for him. Yes. And I love Hugo Grande. He's a great <laughs> character. I was so happy he returned. Yes, thank for, you for yeah. this book. You say is he Yeah, I was just going to say Hugo is I suppose if you like that's me in the novel. That's he's much more like me. <laughs> the, the sarcastic, you know, more or you know, very wary. But what I loved about Hugo was that being around James made Hugo braver and maybe being around Hugo made James a little more compassionate you know they kind of they brought out different sides in each other 
So uh, while I don't know a Hugo myself, that's definitely more the voice of of Steve Cole coming in and talking to James Bond, saying, "Look, come on, what are you doing here, man? This is like crazy." But all right, we'll go along with it because this and it seems such a, an unlikely bond to have formed. Yeah. Plus, I also wanted to get some diversity in there as well, away from from James's being this you know, this, this paragon of of, you know, of physical uh, condition by having someone very unlike that uh, alongside him, but still able to contribute and 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 help James in in his adventures. So yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for not killing Hugo. I, I read that you were intentionally planning on killing him too. Yes, I did. I killed him twice. I, I wrote his death scene twice, but it never. It just seemed it just seemed too much. It seemed yeah. by the end of it. <laughs> it's good. He he might return. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Now one of my favorite uh, small scenes is when James is climbing the building in the beginning when he's trying to um, uh, break in and entering uh, yeah. a bank, I believe it is. I think uh, and he, he's trying to get into the, the penthouse apartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he pretends to be a window cleaner. Yeah. Now, when I was reading it, I, I'm, I'm sure it works out when you write it down. But is it even possible? I mean, he, he <laughs> climbs a wall a that is. Wall. Well, I was looking again, those old newsreels, I was looking at some of the architecture and I could see that there was the, the, the bricks were protruding well out from the mortar uh, in this wall. So it was almost like a, a pattern in the brickwork. So there's enough. It's not easy, of course, but you but want it to be easy. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So it's one of those scenes where you can imagine, you know, it's being shot from from down on the ground. Bond is way up in the air. The, the music is playing the dramatic music as he's. Trying out, he's got the bleeding fingernails and like blooded fingers as he's trying to get up there. He's got this yeah. this pail hanging from one arm as he's trying to do it. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's one of those ones at the limit of possibility. But then so much of the world of James Bond exists at the limit of possibility, and it doesn't stop being thrilled by it. True. I also really like the the diving scenes. I think you you learn James how to dive. Yeah. It's one of the things that Fleming loved, of course. Yes. Uh, diving, and he incorporated a lot of diving scenes, for instance, in um, Live and Let Die. Mm, yeah. So how did you do the research on the old school diving? Well, again, it was uh, a lot of period research, uh, a lot of looking in old magazines, and when I found these images, I was looking at you know, the history of diving over the ages to see what technology would have been available to, to Bond and, and the villains in that book. And while there was very primitive you know, oxygen tanks that you had to regulate the oxygen supply yourself, it didn't seem feasible that, that Bond or, um, or his allies would have access to that. So then I saw that there, were, there was a huge drive to encourage children to make their own diving equipment. I mean, can you imagine in this day and age, uh, you know, teenagers being encouraged to manufacture diving helmets out of you know biscuit barrels and you know, welding in glass stuff it's like that just would never happen now and you know these kids wouldn't have the skills or the or the resources to do it but back then no television or thing you've got all those long evenings why not make your own diving equipment why not risk your life going underwater scouting for treasures you know so when i saw these that there were these kids doing it and there was this bunch of surfers in california and, and divers called the, the suicide club because they would go underwater with that very equipment looking for it and some of the sometimes accidents happened and they were died or badly injured doing it and you think someone like bond of course is going to go straight down there doing that into that inky blackness into the uh, the depths and do that and of course i found out you could go 40 feet down and the waters around parts of cuba aren't so so deep it, it was again it was it was possible and so of course you have that that excitement of bond having this very rickety life support system is dependent entirely on this old bellows and the air yeah. going down the pipe and down into him that would be my idea of hell i have to say which is why you I, can't you can't bend over right you, no, you have right. to stay upright exactly exactly yeah. otherwise the, and someone is yeah. pumping all the time yeah so you've got yeah. that history so, yeah so help me out 40 feet that is about 13 14 meters is uh, that about right um could be yeah i'd have to have a <laughs> I would have put it out at the time, but uh, metric imperial conversions are not my strong, especially especially in my current condition. <laughs> okay, but it's not too deep then. <laughs> not not massive. Deep, but... No, you go down, but there is. I think there's there's a still a danger of the bends. They go down. I think further than forty feet, but uh, and that's why they they're supposed to pause on the way back up to um, allow yourself to sort of equalize a little bit. As it is, they have to things kick off underwater. Yeah. They go out, so they they're lucky. They're lucky because of course the the bends is a, is a horrifying condition that. Um, that many people are you know, crippled or dead. Uh, so you're in a very dangerous situation. And that's, of course, where you want Bond to be. 
you know, he's being shot at, he's disorientated, he's exhausted, he's swimming for his life for the shore he sees there. I mean, what a terrifying situation. Um, and of course, that's what you want, exactly what you want. So yeah, yeah, I enjoy doing those scenes a lot. Yeah. Now, you already said that this is one of your favorites out of the four. Mm. And uh, to me, this book, much more than your first one, follows the recipe of a typical James Bond adventure. Yeah, I, I wrote some stuff down. You have a villain, larger than life, with an excellent name. I really like the Scolopendra. <laughs> Very well found. Funding by the Russians, villainous lair, a henchman with a physical defect, yes. James being tortured, etc. I mean, yep. <laughs> is that the Bond formula? Yeah, it's, it's something I, I kind of, in a way, I think my first my first draft of Hedge Dye is very different. Um, it actually contained Mimic in it as uh, the henchman who would eventually appear in Red Nemesis. Yeah. And Scolopendra was, was called something different as well. I think he was called Dracul, meaning... Um, the the dragon in Romanian I had him as a as a displaced European thing so yeah there were a lot of differences there the veil was was still there she was always part of of the plan but I um I amended things um Jaguar Scolopendra's daughter was originally um a kind of a peasant girl called uh, Anna there are lots of differences so but I I guess I'd been you know reading you know a lot of Fleming and reading a lot about you know the idea of the Fleming sweep and uh, and it, it felt like with Heads You Die, I got much into more of the, the basics of Bond. Um, I had I'd tried to put together a situation, a scenario where Bond could, even though he's not on the Secret Service, he can be swept along by the adventure and meet many of those iconic figures that we find in in, in, in Bond literature and, and the films. So yeah, it was it was intentionally saying, okay, I've I've kind of got to know Bond in Shoot to Kill. Now we're going to take it a step further. We're going to shove him into a proper big old James Bond adventure, a more typical one, perhaps. Uh, one with uh, fewer fewer protagonists. And as you say, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, I loved writing The Fist, The Fist with his, with his big granite hand. Originally, there was another henchman as well who didn't make it in, but he had, uh, he was also disfigured. He had this big uh, scars on his, around his mouth, both vertical and horizontal. So it looked like I had this huge puckered cross on his on his mouth um he was he was quite a fun character as well but he he dropped out during the the rewrites because we we just wanted to bring it back to focus in on the idea of bond and hugo and and the two girls against pretty much everyone else so yeah it went underwent a lot of changes but became my uh, one of my favorites in the process okay let's move on to your third one um strike lightning mm. also it came out in 2016 as well so it was very tight after um uh, had you die yeah and this is uh set i believe at the end of 34 as well yes so your first three books are time-wise they're quite close to each other yeah and we see bond at fetus we do see bond at fetus finally this yeah was always my plan was to do it halfway through the run and rather than you know put him there on his first day as charlie had done in silverfin i wanted him to be you know established there a few months into his time there again just to be different from what's gone before now, I have to say, Fetis College in Edinburgh were absolutely fantastic in the, uh, the setting up of this. They were so helpful because, of course, I got in touch with them. I wanted to research where he'd been. Um, the building, of course, parts of it haven't changed since he was there. But Fetis were, were so helpful. They actually um, went to the, uh, the trouble of contacting some old Fetisians, as they're known, some old boys of the school who had been there in the 1930s when Bond was there, and come in to Fetis, and they put on a lunch, and I was able to talk to them and interview them about their experiences of Fetis in the 30s and what it was like. And, and, and yeah, these old guys, they're in their 90s now, you know, and they couldn't remember maybe the last couple of years of their lives what they've been doing, but their school day memories were so clear. And when they got together, you could see there was this, this bond between them. <laughs> not not that bond, but uh, a bond of uh, you know suffering, if you like, and, and endurance and perseverance that they had, they'd gone through. They would still they'd speak of injustices, like a beating they got for something they didn't do, and you could see in their eyes. They even in their nineties, there was that injustice burning inside them still. Um, it was very interesting, uh, and you know I was we decided I decided you know we went around the different houses and we thought that Bond would most likely have gone to Glencourse because it seemed that sort of ethos fitted best with Bond. And I was shown around there and where the pupils would have been and these sort of like bathroom areas and obviously some of them modernized, but they were there with photographs of what they were like. They still have copies of the school newsletters from, from those times as well. So you can see, so the, the, like the 
the holiday declared because of the uh, the royal wedding, for example, is, uh, is it was real. It was real. It wasn't just made up, you know. So they were so helpful. It was it was really wonderful. When I was saying to them, OK, I need Bond to be able to sneak into the school and get up to you know, the third floor. The archivist there was able to um, describe the route exactly. You know, this is what he'd need to do. He'd need to get in here through the cellars. He'd get past the kitchens. He'd go up there. And then I was able to follow that route myself and then, of course, write it out for James in the book. So, yeah, it was wonderful. They were, they were so helpful. I can't thank them enough. And when it came to launch Strike Lining, uh, the uh, the launch event was at Fettis College. So it was very exciting. I was able to talk to uh, the boys there and uh, their various uh, parents and carers about Bond and the uh, the Fettis connection. Yeah. So it was good to get him into that into school. If I'd been writing the very first set of young bonds or whatever, then maybe I would have put him there in the first book. But this seemed to me uh, the right time to do it. We'd had him in some colourful environments. It was time to bring him back to his home country and then send him off on a different adventure from there. Yeah. Oh, I love the way how you talk about the 30s when Bond was actually there. I mean, we both know he doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. But you do get used to it. And in fact, um, what was very sweet was that after I'd done the launch event at Fetis, um, leavers at the school are given a set of special cufflinks of their house. And I was given a set of uh, Glencore's cufflinks. They said, oh, James James Bond never collected his. We'd like you to accept his part. <laughs> so uh, I have... Uh, very sweetly, I I, uh, I, you know, I was given those, and uh, I, I treasured them. You know, it's like uh, obviously I never went to Fetis, never went to such a distinguished school, but I have these couplings that kind of say that I did <laughs> on James Bond's behalf. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. And and Charlie Hickson was nice enough to send Perry Mandeville uh, to Fetis in one of his books, and we get the return now of Perry Mandeville. We do, we do get his return. That's right. I felt um, for the third book, I didn't have to. You know, I, th I felt I wanted to establish my brand of young Bond over those first two books and then show that these weren't discrete worlds. They weren't separate. I'd already had Charmian briefly in, in both, but it was time to sort of more focus on another character. So, yeah, it was it was fun bringing in Perry and and having him and Bond off on an adventure. My favorite of Charlie's books was By Royal Command. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, you know, which I think is a you know, really terrific book. And uh Perry was obviously, of course, such a vivid character with his uh, stutter and things. So it was, it was looking to see how he used the stutter and then sort of carry that on a little bit. And again, try and push push Perry on a little bit as well in, in, in that story. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, it, was, it was good fun. Is it difficult to use other people's characters instead of your own? I don't, I don't think it's really difficult as such. It's like I write Doctor Who novels using the, the Doctor Who characters. Uh, even when I've not seen them on TV, you still have to you know, use them and, and understand how they work. So it just takes, I think, a, a little bit of extra thinking because mm. you don't want to obviously portray them entirely differently to how they've gone before. But equally, you know, I'd, I'd pushed Bond, Bond on a little further by then. And, you know, and I know as well from, you know, when you're younger, you know, not all friendships last forever. You, you outgrow each other, you know. There's, uh, I know that from you know, my, own, my own school days and from, you know, those of you know, teen boys that I've, I've met and know. And so you were, uh, it's not always a given that they'd be able to pick up exactly where they left off. But because they have certain things in common, like this this mad rush for, for danger, you know there's always going to be a connection between them. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I kind of injured him. He wouldn't be there in the climax because it would feel too cosy if Bond was going in there with his, with his you know, a good friend alongside him. I was, I was very much glad to have him there as, as a, you know, a lightening factor, much as, as Hugo lightens some of the yeah. in, yeah. in, yeah. uh, in Heads You Die. I think Perry helps out with some of the... Uh, the sinister gloom in uh, Strike Lightning. Yeah. Now, this might just be me, but I found that on Charmian's um, reluctance to accept James's story about the incident that happened at the school with the lightning was a bit out of character, how I interpret yeah. her character from, from Charlie Hickson's books. Because I, I would imagine she's being always very inquisitive and she's a very strong character. Wouldn't she ask more questions, have more doubts? I mean, in your book, she readily accepts the school version of events and she easily dismisses James's version of what happened. I think, yeah, I know what you mean. And that was something that I, I didn't want her to be too supportive of James. I know that she is and they have you know, a great friendship, but also we have to consider the, the reality of the situation. I mean, she's not being told this by sketchy characters. She's being told it by the head teacher of an extremely impressive school 
there's this sense of a conspiracy crushing down on there that Charmin doesn't necessarily realise. Um, she knows that James tends to go off and, and do things and after Heads You Die, when he's been involved in this massive adventure, how much she, she loves him and, and appreciates his, his quest for adventure. She's also his guardian and she's also going to have an element of something terrible is going to happen to you, James. And I think that when this happens, it seems quite, quite plausible to her and it kind of maybe makes her question that. And then she knows that James is, is struggling and that he's lost a friend, but she also isn't going to outright believe him. I think that what what she might have there is the seeds of doubt in her mind that, that there is something going on. But equally, she's intelligent enough to know that if she if she does say, OK, James, I believe you, there could be people and then talks to the head teacher that can make the whole situation worse. So we're not in Chimian's head for Strike Lightning. We're in James's head and he's feeling isolated and alone. And it could be that I, know, I like to think that Chimian does believe him. But equally, she knows she has to play her part in accepting the, the story she's told, because if she does say, it's all right, James, no, I believe you. I'm going to be trying to find this. What can she do? What can she actually do? Because if the head teacher is involved in this situation, she's putting James in more danger by saying that she doesn't believe it. She's possibly putting herself in danger as well. Yeah. So there's an element of, we, we hopefully as readers, we feel the slight injustice that James isn't being believed. And I think having Charmian say, I'm sorry, James, you know, this is a tragic situation. A, it would, it would feel plausible to her because there are repercussions to, uh, to certain acts of of, uh, of gung-ho uh, adventurism. Bond is an adrenaline drunk junkie, and there could be a time when that uh, luck runs out. So it's plausible to her that this could have happened, but I think even if she does have that element of doubt, she is probably, yeah, keeping it to herself for yeah. the time being and seeing how things play out. Yeah, I was expecting some sort of scene with them uh, in the back of a taxi or something, and they would have a private time to, to discuss matters, but that never happened. So. No, they never had the opportunity, unfortunately, in this book. Yeah. But I'm sure it happened off the page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, this book, to me, uh, becomes quite dark, uh, especially after your other two books. And the, the themes of this book uh, integrate the, the looming uh, Second World War, the armament race. Yeah. And this is quite new for James Bond. It's never really addressed in, in any other of the, the novels. Um, so how do you keep this period, uh, which happened a long time ago, how do you keep it interesting and understandable for, for young adults? Originally, there was a lot more the armaments race stuff put in. I found that, you know, I always wanted to kind of fill in the reality of it. And uh, like, for example, Shoot to Kill lost a whole subplot about trades unions in um, Hollywood at the time, because I found it fascinating that The gangsters in real life at that time were controlling the trades unions um, and basically taking a big cut from the movie bosses in order to keep the uh, the staff from striking. You know, so that all that all went because that wasn't deemed interesting enough to, to younger readers. And you know, quite rightly, really, it, it didn't need it. It was a level of complexity that wasn't needed with the arms race thing. I, I kind of wanted to get it across as, as simply as possible. And I think that's one of the reasons why I went for technology that was more advanced than we would have had in the 1930s, but still theoretically possible. So you can sort of you can get away with giving some more information about the arms race if you then exemplify it by something a little bit more fantastical and interesting and visually striking. So that was where the idea of the steel shadows came from. It was the idea of I mean I knew I knew that I would uh, I'd get into uh, trouble with some some Bond fans for this. I knew <laughs> that uh, it's the uh, it's the most fantastical and I'd been de very deliberately playing down the whole fantasy element but it struck me you know that in, in Fleming's novels there are elements of fantasy I mean like the, the giant squid in, in Doctor No we've got the uh, supernatural stuff in, uh, in Live and Let Die which you know, Bond has no trouble believing in, in psychic powers so it, I thought if we were having an Iron Man suit in the 1930s you know how would you achieve that and so i did a lot of research into um you know the electronics and the, and the hydraulics and, and the history of the exosuit uh, which obviously didn't really start to come on until the 60s when we could miniaturize components but then it occurred to me that if you weren't trying to steer it manually if you had to rely on like pre-programmed moves that you'd be able to punch in with like an old-fashioned machine code i just thought i thought james bond james bond goes steampunk might be um an interesting thing to explore by book three and i tried to make sure that the rest of it was very historically accurate just to to keep the fantasy from taking over were you surprised by the criticisms on the fantasy element the bond versus iron man uh... <laughs> i wasn't i wasn't surprised i was i was pleased that there was also for some that's their favorite book and i also thought if i'm telling a bunch of you know disinterested teen boys imagine james bond fighting a massive clunky iron man in the in the 
back in time. That is way that they're going to say, oh, yeah, I might pick that up and give that a, a read. You think about <laughs> your, your core audience, you know. Um, and I'm a big Iron Man fan. You know, I'm a big, big fan of the Marvel superheroes. Uh, but I also had this, this, this idea of Bond in this big gladiatorial contest. It felt quite Bond to me. And to have him trapped in this really unwieldy, clunky suit, because it is a primitive weapon from the 30s. But also, I mean, when I was doing my research, I found that there was lots of, there were little sidesteps into this this, this bizarre landscape of warfare where you would have like you know remote control tanks were an actual thing they were sending out you know remote control driven tanks um into the the battle space they were wiring up you know dolphins to plant bombs on on ships they were doing all sorts of odd stuff thinking outside sharks with lasers on their heads (laughs) exactly we've got all this uh I don't think we went the full mutated sea bass, but we, we got close. Um, I mean, they, they, they put phosphor bombs on bats towards the end of World War II and released them into Japan in the hope that they would then ignite and set up all uh, Japan's all, like, you know, paper buildings. You know, this was running alongside the development of the of the H-bomb. They had the, the two different things in tandem. So it was, it, it, it didn't, for me, once you've um, said, okay, well, it exists at the, at the realms of extreme possibility. Um, it's within that we can we can have some interest with this you know it wasn't like i was having a proper iron man suit which can like you know run around and fire under its own its, its wear is volition it's really being strapped into this man portable tank and being forced to kill people it's the machine killing people you're the one pressing the buttons trying to stay alive you've got a flamethrower you've got a machine gun you can't turn quickly you can't you have to punch in a code to get you to go forward, a gear shift to get you to go back. So it's you've got a steam engine bubbling away on your back doing it. It just struck me as uh, as exciting. It was worth it was worth weathering the storm of um, the more uh, you know factually minded Bond purists in order to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I really don't mind it at all. I think it was great fun uh, to to see new things uh, happen. I also really enjoyed the time that you have Bond spend in uh, the Hague. Uh, and Rotterdam or yeah. Den Haag and uh, Rotterdam indeed <laughs> what were your own experiences did you come to the Netherlands to I research did. yes I did yes and I um I went all around all around the streets of uh, of the Hague um working out James's route out from the hotel um when he's trying to find a taxi and so I was going around all these back streets and taking pictures of the place to uh to make sure that I represented it I hope accurately um and you know made the the trip to Rotterdam and Looked around the zoo there, in fact, which was very pleasant. Um, and on the way back, I was looking out, imagining which parts of the landscape would have been the same in the 30s. And, you know, just little details like knowing which way the sun was shining at that time of day. You know, it just, it just, it just helped bring alive. A lot of the research you do into any location, any field, a good 80% of it you leave out. But what it allows you to do is to have a confident image of the place in your head, enough knowledge to uh, to make you sound like you know what you're talking about. And I think... Obviously, one of the things we think about when we think of Fleming's writing is the authenticity of everything, the the usage of, of brand names, the usage of uh, you know the, the best in its class, in whatever yeah. he was doing. All these things help us you know, help build a, a compelling and convincing worldview. And I think that's what you, you need to, to bring to, to any adventure happening in a different time, in a different place. So, yeah, if you can go there, it's great. But in a way, you can't go into the past. So you also have to look and, uh, and read you know, other books that were actually written during that time. I mean, Eric yeah. Adler, you know, wrote a lot of spy uh, short stories and novels using trains and things. And so I used, I, I drew elements on those for you know, some of the descriptions of the, the trains at the time. I also talked to, um, there's a, a rail museum, is it, is it in Utrecht, I think? Yeah, um, yeah. Spoorweg Museum yeah. in Utrecht. Yeah, yeah. and I, uh, I, I, I contacted uh, the museum curator there and uh, talked to her about um, my needs in terms of uh, you know, what trains would be here, what trams would be here, when was this station open? Um, Because there was, you know, I couldn't get all the information online. And, you know, she was extremely generous um, in her time and she directed me to a book that I was able to get hold of. And that gave me more information. And uh, but no, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a lovely trip I had to, uh, to, to I went to uh, Scheveningen as well and uh, went there and looked around that neighbourhood and what a, what a marvellous beach there is there that goes on yeah. for, so, for so long. Um, and, uh, yeah, I enjoyed my visit very much. It was great bringing elements of that. Uh, into into Bond's story in Strike Lightning. What you said about authenticity, um, what what strikes me is that uh, most people probably won't know this, but when I read about the time that Bond spends in um, in the Netherlands, and you have him go all the way to Wassenaar, every person in the Netherlands knows that that is a very posh town. Only rich people live there. 
probably other people won't know that in mm. the, that live in other countries, but it's so plausible that someone would have a mansion up there. That it yeah. just makes perfect sense for us. Oh, good. I'm so glad. That I mean, makes it... You do. I was looking for suitable suitable areas where you would have that. Makes that perfect model. sense. And then, uh, yeah. and of course, I would then able to check on Google Google Earth what the streets look like now, and some you can see. Yes, they do have these these final buildings that, that date back a long way. So yeah, really, really helpful to me just to confirm. Yeah, yeah. but we'll stick in there. <laughs> yeah. Now, did it ever occur to you that poor Nathaniel Parker needed to narrate those extremely difficult Dutch street names and Dutch conversations that you put in your book for the audiobook version? Nathaniel has his job to do, and I have my job. To do. <laughs> uh, so I can't make concession to uh, to that. But you know, I know what an accomplished actor he is. You know, he'll have no trouble, uh, you know, researching that online, because checking it. Back. I- I read the book first um, as an ebook uh, when it came out, and then I only listened to the audiobook version uh, recently. How does he do? How does he get on? When it's an English character pronouncing Dutch names like uh, Shavening, the way you say it, uh-huh. uh, I think it's fine because that's the way an English person uh, would say it. Mm. But then, as the narrator of the book. Uh-huh. So he wasn't always spot. It's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> um, last question on Strike Lightning is um, about Hertha. I really like Hertha as mm-hmm. an evil henchwoman. And uh, she's intelligent. She's uh, merciless. Did you have a template for her uh, from from famous henchwomen, or what makes a good henchman, henchwoman? Um, I think you're always looking for elements of of cruelty. Um, sometimes it's written into their physical form, and it's as a manifest expression of, of that cruelty other times they might look beautiful of course but inside things are different with her what i what i wanted to do was i didn't want to kind of go into that that, that horrible cliche of you know the nazi dominatrix type um <laughs> i didn't want to do that but i wanted to have someone who you know she's frustrated you know women weren't allowed in the ss although clearly she's more capable than many of her colleagues she would have that that resentment burning in, in inside her as well which has probably turned her you know even more cruel more merciless to show people that she's she's better and tougher than any man you know as part of her her own mission statement i think um and because it obviously it's about you know the human body being sort of like strapped into mechanical contrivances and steel shadows or the uh, of the blood banners that the germans have you need someone who would have a, a strong understanding of the musculature of, of the human being and of course when you know which parts can hurt can give the most pain that's something you're going to be dwelling on that's that's a talent you have um and it makes it very dangerous of course because she can yeah she can inflict the most terrible pain you know pretty much by just knowing just touching you in the right place the right combination of uh, of trigger spots that are going to yeah inflict hell upon uh, your, your person and you know she probably started off doing this realizing that it was a useful asset an interrogation asset and i think as as time goes on and she becomes more twisted and more mired in the horror of what she's doing it becomes more fun to her it becomes a, a way of getting out her own frustrations and her own aggressions and i think you know we, we can see elements of that in some of uh, some of fleming's uh, evil women characters as well you can see that they uh, they excel in uh, in the hardness and unnatural cruelty. Um, of course, when you're creating baddies in books, you um, you can't just say, "Oh yeah, they're bad because they're bad." You have to think about why they've why they've got there, why they've uh, become this way. Often in in Bond, there's there's no redemption for a bad character, and sometimes you know it's it's more satisfying to leave those those characters bad. But certainly, when I killed off uh, Herta in the end. It was a satisfying uh, moment because <laughs> oh man, I hated her. <laughs> like her. so, I was I was really really pleased to be able to uh, visit an unpleasant retribution on her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the baddie should die an evil death. Yeah, we talked about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move on to your final book, Red Nemesis. Now, there is some time between the story in Strike Lightning and this one. This is about six months Mm -hmm. after Strike Lightning. So um, a good period of time uh, has passed. Mm. uh, And there's a good reason for that in the in the book as well, because time was needed for certain things. Now, I I don't want to go into too much spoilers here, because this is a book that has plenty of spoilers that are very yeah. personal to James. So let's try to keep it um, as, as clear as, as we can. 
it opens very darkly with a Russian architect breaking his daughter's leg yeah. in, in London. That was very... A startling opening. It was uh, shocking to me when I when I read that. Well, good. That was. Uh, I'm glad you didn't just <laughs> take it in your stride. The idea was to have. Oh my God! What would drive a man to to do this to his daughter, especially when he knows that her legs are? You know, she's a ballerina. You know, she needs to be able to dance. What the hell is he doing? Exactly. And then, of course, we we, we find out over the course of, uh, of of the book. Plus, also, it's uh, it's setting up um, Anya. Uh, and her character, I wanted to have a slightly different take. I always, I always went for a different take on on the Bond girl or the or the. Oh, Anya's very sad as a character. Yeah, right? yeah, she's she's been through a lot, but then so is James. You know, I mean, they they both I think recognise that in each other, um, mm. and it, and she felt absolutely the right character for for this particular novel. This was the one that I've been building towards. This was yeah, yeah if you like the the payoff for me of what I've been doing. I've taken James from this, this quite buoyant adventure in Shoot to Kill. Yes, it's there, there's darkness there, but he's got a lot of friends around him. He's got allies and support. He's looking after a little kind of group of people at the end. And each time through the books, we see that being whittled away. Uh, he's got Hugo and, and uh, Jaguar around him in, in Hedge You Die. He's got Perry and Kitty Drift in Strike Lightning. But when it comes down to it, it's always James on his own. And he's, yeah. he is the one who has to, to, to bring the change and to resolve events so it was really trying to take James way out of his comfort zone in this book uh, given the most intensely personal quest so his mind might be not as not as cool he might mm. miss a couple of clues that otherwise he would have picked up on about uh, how things are going so for me it was the one that I was I was determined to uh, to get right and it was probably the one that that changed least between first draft and fourth and fifth draft as as we went on although strike lightning also didn't change so much the main change with with red nemesis was that originally um, booty and hugo from um shoot to kill were they returned uh, yeah they returned yeah they were they were there kind of in the beginning and in the end sections but that although i really wanted to bring hugo back it it didn't quite he seemed surplus to requirement i didn't have mm. him to do it just felt like it's nice to see him but He's not doing enough. So, and similarly with Tori, where I wanted to bring her back, I wanted to kind of no. bring back the characters and and have them have one last you know, scene together. But it just felt indulgent, really. It didn't. It, yeah. Yeah, it so, probably would have distracted. Exactly, from, that's, from that's, plot, what, yeah. that's what. But you do introduce Mimic here, a really that's, creepy character. Yes, yeah, so again, I tried. I tried to put into Strike Lightning as well yeah. um, for a while. But uh, but he, his talents weren't uh, weren't being. But here he really fits. I mean, yeah. he's, he's he's pivotal to the story as That's well, right. to the plot of the villain. Exactly, and I knew that it was you know it was my last chance to use him. So when when doing the plot, I was very keen to have a role for Mimic um, that was that was you know strong and uh, and well motivated because I really wanted him to go in because he'd been creeping me out for like, for a couple of books you know and, and writing his scenes had always been had always been good fun. So yeah, it was it was good fun being able to do that at last. And of course, he dies a gruesome death. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, he, he meets he meets a, a fitting fate. I think it's one of those things where it's I don't know. Whereas mimic can can imitate not only voices but also fighting styles as well. It makes him a very dangerous opponent. And it's then it's trying to find that weak spot that will allow James to get the upper hand because he seems like. You know, he's, he's going to be you know, outclassed, or this 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 mimic is almost supernatural in a way, in, in his uncanniness of his abilities, and the way he uses those to um, distract his opponents, the way he can imitate people that Bond knows closely, and have them say, you know, words that might be in their last words. Who knows? Um, was uh, yeah, good for pressing James' yeah. buttons. Yeah, press they press my buttons at the same time I'm writing it, which makes me. You know, you, you do get you get so invested in it all. You get so caught up with all the Bond novels I did. The climaxes were written in a very short space of time. I would normally do without sleep completely and just write in a big 28, 30-hour binge where you just start at 9 in the morning, stop for, for meals, but basically work all through the day, all through the night, right the way through the night, right through the next morning, trying to get to the last word um, in the book. So I'd write often about, you know, 10,000 words would, would come in, in the last the last um, stretch, because you're so full of the adrenaline of what's happening to James, it kind of drives you along to keep propelling him forward, and you get almost feverish in that. So um, with, with Red Nemesis, that was really 
wow, that was. <laughs> it's no wonder I needed a break after these books. I put, I put quite a lot into it. <laughs> yeah, and this is by far his most personal adventure yet. Yeah. Was that also influenced by the direction of the the recent films that they tend to become less fantastical, a bit more personal? They become. I mean, especially with Daniel Craig and, and Skyfall and... Um... Yeah, but I think it was... The motivation was uh, was wanting to get something that, that, yeah, that strikes really at the heart of James and the idea that uh, his father... Something that's come from his father when they find this, this backpack from his father that's been thawed out um, in Switzerland and, and kind of sent to him containing this, this letter which seems to be more than just a letter. It seems to be a, a code hinting at something. Of course, it's something that James is going to be obsessing about solving because this is a way to find out what his father was doing. But of course, it also leads him to realise that he doesn't know as much about his father as he believes he does. Um, and so, yeah, it's quite a... That's what I wanted to get to do. By the time of Skyfall, of course, it's all it's all the past. But here we are with an opportunity to explore it when it was closer to James's present. Um, so it's a different perspective on it. And uh, and yeah, so it was it was... Yeah, satisfying to be able to do that. For a while, I wasn't sure whether the Fleming estate would go for it and allow me to do it. But uh, but when they read the, the synopsis, the storyline, they they came back and gave it the thumbs up and I was very, um, very pleased when that was. Yeah, that's uh, great. You remember that. One question I have is about the, the politics of this book. Um, it's pitting Soviet Russia against the UK. Mm. Um, what were challenges in explaining this long grey history and geopolitics to a young audience? Yeah, it's complex it. stuff. It is complex stuff, and um, I remember a lot of stuff being excised from an early draft. To uh, as we went forward, we we did snip out some of that. Originally, I put I always put more detail in than than perhaps is is you can get away with less. But I like to feel it's well covered. There was like in Shoot to Kill, there was a lot of stuff about the Hayes Code, about um, the American code of censorship at the time. Weirdly, my I did a film studies component in my university degree, and my film studies tutor was Andrew Hickson, who was Charlie Hickson's brother. So it was Andrew Hickson who taught me all about um, 1930s Hollywood cinema, classical Hollywood cinema. Um, so in a way, I had both Hicksons helping me with, uh, you know, directing me to this point. That's very bizarre. But with, um, yeah, Red Nemesis and the Soviet angle, yes, it was extremely extremely complicated but of course you know Fleming himself as a journalist was involved in you know significant uh, events with the Soviet Union and initial show trials of of uh, suspected spies who were actually you know working on them um, there were engineers working over there through Vickers and of course Bond's father being linked to Vickers it all seemed to to add up in my head to something that would make a really strong Bond plot and that involved yes a bit of educating people on the on the relationship between the Soviet Union and England but essentially um, as we see with with uh, the, the state of current political affairs with Russia, the relationship is is uneasy. It's, it is. It's not it good. is yeah. it's not great. And and so in a way, I've always maintained that by setting Young Bond in the 30s, it does offer a, a kind of mirror to where we are now. It's uh, you know the 30s are a decade summed up by massive political turbulence, by a rise of the of the far right, uh, an increase in totalitarian regimes in the wake of a big financial slump. So in many ways, there are many warnings in the 1930s that I think younger generations need to be aware of today as they kind of yeah. move forward. So uh, it was it was trying to um, bring across some of the uh, the real sense of threat and danger that the Soviet Union posed. What a, what a terrifying place to live it would have been in the 1930s, whilst also um, maintaining the the thriller action and the spy craft. Again, James has to do a lot. Yeah. Lost. But you also humanize the Russians uh, a lot. I mean, yeah. you, you you make it abundantly clear that they're just a peoples like like we are. Yeah, that's always that's mm. always, you know that's always the case, isn't it? I mean, we're, yeah. we're taught we're not we're not taught, but it's so easy to to demonize an enemy on mass in one big solid mass. Yeah. When you you know you think a lot of the people involved there, like us, you know, there are different, there are shades of grey as yeah. you want yeah. to, or shades of red, and you to um, get, get get elements of that across, yeah. By, they have their motivations just as we have our motivations response. Now, there are so many things in this book with returning characters and, and plot developments that I really don't want to get into because I don't want to spoil it. So my last question on Red Nemesis is about the audiobook. Uh -huh. uh, with only recently, it was published, yeah. finally. I was waiting for it for, for over a year. Yeah, many people um, were. <laughs> Yeah, and then finally it came just in time for my preparations for this uh, conversation we're having right now. 
So was there any uh, collaboration between you and Nathaniel um, because he has to voice your characters? Yeah, well, I, I think because yeah, he just comes in and, and, and reads reads the, uh, the the prose. So in a way, it's all fixed down by then. So no, I was I was not involved or consulted in, in anything or asked to uh, confirm any pronunciations or, or motivations. I think it's just left to him to get on with. Have you listened to parts of it? Um, I haven't listened to Red Nemesis yet. No, no, I haven't had a chance to, uh, unfortunately. But, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. It's been a long time yeah. coming. So yeah, it'll be nice yeah. to uh, stick on in the car one day and and I think, oh gosh, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's played Bond now for nine times, uh, yeah. nine, nine different books. Mm. Um, and I think he did an excellent job yeah. um, uh, as well. So on the continuation of Young Bond, is it going to continue? Um, I, hope, I hope they'll bring him back. Yeah, I think um, if they do, it'll probably be as another, you know, mini series of, of books, another little progression, like uh, with a new author. Online. I imagine so. Yeah, I think that they'll want I mean, part of the the whole fun of it, like, as with the adult um, Bond continuation novels, is seeing who's going to do it and who's going to bring a different take to it, um, a different twist on on things. So uh, I feel I've I've you know in in I, it's one of those characters. I know I'd. I'd I'd, I think I'd like to come back to him at some point. I don't know when. Um, if I was asked to do a short story or something, I'd be very, very excited to do so. But equally, I'd be excited to see what someone else did with him as well. I'd love the young Bond to be somehow involved you know, with the Spanish Civil War a couple of years later on. Um, with the, I'd really love to uh, to set a story in the um, immediate build-up to World War II when things are really getting moving. I think that would be very exciting. And have Bond make his decision to um, you know, lie about his age and, and you know, sign up for the Second World War. That would be exciting to be able to be handling that. That's what, exactly what they're doing with the comics right now. The oh, dynamite right, of the comics. beginning of the war, are they? Or, yeah, that's oh, where he enlists and... Oh, um, brilliant. Yes, well, there you go. That's the kind of thing I think will work brilliantly. I'd love to, yeah. to know more about Bond's uh, wartime career. I think there's some fantastic stories. Again. And of course, when he's 16 and in Paris. <laughs> and will, he loses his... Be, yeah, that will be the uh, mature audiences only. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, the slightly yes, less young Bond. <laughs> yeah, well, he's he's fifteen now, right? At the end of your book, so yeah. he, he should be around sixteen. Yeah, yeah. What if they ask you for an adult Bond book oh, short story? Yeah, you I'm just said thrilled. Yeah, absolutely, with no hesitation. That would be so exciting. But uh, you know, I I feel very happy to have my my name added to those list of people who've been able to bring new original adventures to the James Bond franchise. There's so many you know, amazing authors who've been involved. I feel very privileged to have had my name mm. added to a, a list of those who've just got to play with such a cool character, you know, just got to uh, take a, put my own little stamp on the, on a little, you know, just a, like a year of his life. That's, uh, yeah, that's exactly. Something. That's very nice. So um, what other projects have you going on now? Because now. Bond is in the past. Yep. Um, right now I'm writing a very different sort of a book for kind of teens which takes place in in the present it actually is it looks at um though we couldn't have um our cell phones our tablets our computers they all depend on tin for the solder that uh, goes into the um the circuit boards but uh the, and tin is basically causing a huge environmental disaster on these indonesian islands where it's mined it's led to a huge amount of illegal mining, child mining as well. And so I'm writing a, boy, uh, a book about a boy who's involved in this situation where people are risking their lives for a few you know, kilograms of, uh, of tin ore that they can then sell and get enough money to eat. You know, wow. it's, a, it's a terrifying situation, but it's one that I think needs you know, more awareness around it. So that's publishing next year. I'm also doing a couple of uh, younger series, one with uh, a TV presenter called uh, Ben Fogel. Over here is... Um, well known as kind of an adventurer, he recently climbed Everest for a TV documentary. So I'm writing some some younger fiction books with him, and uh, and a new one of my um, my sort of fantasy younger adventure series as well called Adventure Duck, which couldn't be further from the uh, solemnity of uh, the young James Bond. At the same time, I'm also thinking of uh, of a new um, young adult book I want to I want to write. So it's, 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 I always think once I've done one thing, I've operated in one area for a while. It's nice then to get into another mindset. I mean, in, next month I have a new Doctor Who book coming out for the new female Doctor Who. Jodie Foster. Yep, yeah, Jodie Whittaker. Yeah. Yep. Oh, Whittaker. Yeah. Sorry. And, uh, she's, uh, she's going down a storm over here now, I think. She's two episodes into her season. So that was I was having to write that over the summer and uh, 
that's exciting to have a bit of Doctor Who back again, a bit of you know space and aliens and things, very different from from Spycraft in the, the 1930s. But it keeps your imagination on its toes, you know. It, it means you're thinking about things in different ways and you're resting those muscles. So when I do come back, as I'm sure I will, to uh, that uh, the, the full-on thriller genre, there will be things going on in the back of my head that I'll be able to bring to that, you know, those well-rested, I'll be able to, you know, the muscle memory will kick in and we'll be off on a whole new lot of adventures, I'm sure. Just when uh, you know, the right ingredients gather in the back of their head. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yes, We've you been too. talking for a very long time. I just have uh, a few more closing double-O questions for you. Okay. Would that be okay? Of course, yes. So, if you could go on a date with a Bond girl, who would you choose and what would you do? <laughs> what would I do? Yeah, what would you do? <laughs> um, Looking for shells? I think, of, of, of course, yeah, dis discussing, discussing matters of the day. Um, I think I would have to go for... I'm a big fan of the, uh, the original Avengers series of the 1960s, so I think I'd have to go for... Honor Blackman and uh, Diana Rigg. So yeah, Tracy and uh, Pussy. Oh, double date. Yeah, Man, that's well, very uh, nice. With them would be would be pretty good. Yeah, I think we'd. Uh, I think <laughs> I'd have fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how do you take your vodka martini? I would take a gin martini actually. So neither shaken nor stirred because I'd be uh, I'd be no no vodka in it. <laughs> I'd go for the gin option. Um, is there a particular Bond song or music cue that you like? Oh, well, all of them, of course, but well, well, so many of them. I think my my favourite is, or well, my favourite currently because it always changes. Probably Backseat Driver from Tomorrow Never Dies. Oh really? Wow. I just love that's that's a very specific cue. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a that's a song. That's for me. It was when it it kicks in. It's you know, it's just an exciting tune. If I'm writing an action scene, for example, that's a good one to have one in the background because it's so galvanizing. And of course, you've got the you know, visions from that. But um, but then I'm also, you know, very, very fond of um, you know, Snow Job from View to a Kill. Yeah. And I have a, a definite soft spot for, for the scenes in the films where you get the, the slow orchestral love theme version of, mm. the, uh, of the main title track. Uh, oh, that's very nice. I enjoy the opulence of, of those as well. And I'll tell you my guilty... Bond music you pleasure is the uh, the closing titles version of Moonraker, the uh, the big disco version. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, when I uh, when I hear that, my, my foot starts tapping. I think it's just a wonderful bit of disco disco cheese. It's funny how something like you know Living Let Die, which is my all time favourite theme, that still stands the test of time today. Yeah. I think yeah. more of the time said it was like listening to the future, and and in a way, you know, it it, it, it is. It hasn't dated, and you get some some that have dated so badly, like like Moonraker or like uh, the Man with the Golden Gun, but they still have you know, their charms and their appeals. So uh, yeah, I I listen, I listen to a lot of Bond music when writing the novels. It felt yeah, it's good. very very easy to listen to. Yeah. So last question, Steve, can you quote the famous line, "My name is Bond, James Bond." <laughs> My name is Bond, James Bond. Oh, how amazing was that? You know, it's strange, but. I get so excited by these interviews. That moment when you get an email from Anthony Horowitz or Charlie Hickson and, and now Steve Cole to, to let you know that they want to have a chat and then you try to figure out a date and a time and then, then the preparations start and I, I reread all the books and I make notes and I write down questions. And then on the day when the actual interview starts and you connect through Skype, there's this brief moment of tension and things going through my head. Will the, will the internet be all right? Will the connection be stable? Um, and how is the audio quality? And then don't forget to, to, to hit record, otherwise everything is lost. And what kind of voice does he have? And then as you start talking, you find out that he's actually this very approachable guy. And Steve is a very big Bond fan and so enthusiastic and, and passionate about his work. And as the interview progresses, I realize I get these very elaborate answers and thoughts and doubts and everything. You know, that's just the strangest thing that you can very briefly connect and share some time. Now, looking back at the interview and, and after editing the whole thing, there are some things that really interested me to, to learn more about the writing process. Now, I'm not a writer, so I don't know much about how to write a novel 
But what struck me is that, for instance, you can take out a character out of a book completely. Take Mimic. Mimic is a henchman that eventually shows up in Red Nemesis, but or the first time that Steve wrote his character was in Heads You Die, his second book. And then when that didn't work out, he tried to put him in his third book, Strike Lightning. I really don't know how that would work, just to put a character in and out and put, you know... That, that's just the way an author does, I guess. But I also really liked was how he took out subplots. He briefly mentioned something with the union strike in the US in Shoot to Kill. I think that's a good thing that you can um, take subplots out that make it over, um, overly complex and stuff. So that's that's good. What I also really found fascinating is um, the, the things that go on in your head when you're thinking of killing off characters. Now, I, I don't mean the the henchmen or the the main villains but actual friends of james uh, like hugo grande or tori woe or perry mandeville uh, and others are you going to kill them off or are you going to keep them alive and are you going to bring them back or not um, and it must be so strange after spending so much time with the character that it's almost like a real person one very strong point, I believe, of, of his whole tenure was that the complete story arc was already known to him and, and Steve was consciously building up to its fourth and final book. And that really makes it a strong cohesion between his four different adventures. And one last thing that really struck me is how he likes to listen to James Bond music when he's writing, especially the track Backseat Driver. That's so specific. Um, it's a very... Uh, tense uh, music cue with uh, a lot of momentum in it and I can just completely picture Steve sitting in his office writing an action scene uh, all through the night with that musing on loop and going on and on and on it's just that creates like an image that I cannot forget now I really for the last time want to thank Steve for his time he felt quite under the weather and still he was very talkative and, and candid and I also want to thank Ian Fleming Publications for getting me in touch with, uh, with Steve. I'm, I'm sure they listen to this podcast and appreciate what we've done. I've already mentioned that Double O Files is a very new platform, and that means I would love to hear from you. Any feedback you want to send, any questions, any suggestions, anything really, please get in touch. And you can send an email to moneypenny at the com. I'll include the address also in the show notes. Now we get to the very final, very special ending of this podcast, a world exclusive. When I was corresponding with Steve trying to arrange this interview, he mentioned he was working on a theme song for his book, Shoot to Kill, and he was wondering if this might be something for the podcast, which would also give him some sort of deadline to actually finish the song. Now, like Steve, I absolutely adore James Bond music, and I immediately let him know I would love to include his theme song into the podcast. So before I'm actually going to play it now, I should do the credits properly. So, um, <clears throat> you're going to listen to Shoot to Kill by Steve Cole and Jason Laboric featuring Karen Casey. Now, the full credits, like who's on strings, who's on electric guitar, who does the backing vocals, stuff like that, I'll put those also in the show notes. All right, here we go. A brand new James Bond theme song, Shoot to Kill.
Shoot to kill.